Okay, bonjour everyone, and welcome to my talk. I see the clickback title worked really well. Let's see if I only baited you here, or if there's something to learn after all. So, leadership and the secret source to kickstart your career in the gaming industry. So, first of all, who the heck am I? I didn't know there would be an introduction, so let's all pretend that didn't happen. Uh, I studied here 2016 to 2019, game design and project management in a minor. This here is a picture of me and my team, uh, second year in our project. And it was a lot of fun assembling the team, and we are still friends to this day. So you can forge great friendships here on the island as well. So, what's happened after my studies? Uh, two months roughly after I was done studying here, I started in the gaming industry at Colby Games, a mobile game studio that later got bought by Ubisoft. And there I started Junior QA. Uh, quickly though, I realized uh, QA itself was not enough for me. I rather wanted to go more in like a team leadership, team management position. So I worked my way up there in two years towards senior QA specialist, where I took more and more responsibilities of leading a team. Uh, but after a while, after three years there, it was time for me to change and to just go in a full QA lead position. And that's when I then came back to Sweden and started working at Paradox Interactive mid of last year. And uh, Paradox Interactive, you might know from a few games like Crusader King, City Skylines, Stellaris, Hearts of Iron, Uper Universalis and other franchises. But I can't sadly talk about what I'm working on since it's an undisclosed project. So how did I get to this topic? Well, there were two things that I thought about mainly. And, uh, you know, I like to use Venn diagrams. So the first one was, what would I have liked to learn back then when I was studying? What kind of talk would have helped me the most from that perspective? And also, what do I think now would benefit you guys starting out in the industry? Adding to that, the last part, what I actually do know, and you see the intersection is so small, it was basically this talk or talking about what's the best time to brew the tea in the morning, and that's not that interesting. But anyway, let's get started with the topic at hand in the first chapter, leadership. It's quite the nebulous concept, actually, and there's a lot of definitions and different opinions on what leadership actually is. So let's agree on the following, which is a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. Leadership basically encompasses the practical ability of an individual, group, organization to influence or guide others, individuals, teams, or entire organizations. What well, it can also be defined as is a process of social influence in which a person can enlist the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task. Very dry formulations. So now that we sort of agree on what leadership is, I want to pose a question to the room where I'm interested to see what you guys think. Because there's like two main concepts and principles that people think of when they hear leadership. Either leaders are born, so the skills are mainly inherited. It's just the way you're born, the way you act, the way your soft skills are. Or it's something that everyone can be made into, that you can learn, that you can strive to be, that you accomplish yourself. So now think of it for a second. And I would like to see first the people that think leaders are mostly born, mostly inherited, to raise their hand. Oh, a few hands. Okay. And who here thinks leaders are definitely more made? It's a skill you learn. Oh, the vast majority. Interesting. <laughs> well, I tricked you a little bit because the true answer is, and that is from a quite recent study that was done in 2014, that they learned that 30% of the skills are inherited, 70% are learned, but more importantly, 100% of them are done not in a vacuum, which means no matter if you have the skills or not, if you don't have the environment where you can use them, where you can strive in, and where you can actually accomplish using that skill, therefore not. And the interesting thing then is, it also means that everyone in theory can become a leader because only very few people actually are born of those capabilities. But the main important phrasing here is the potential. Because the harsh truth is as well that while leadership can be for everyone, not everyone can be a leader. That might sound very harsh at the beginning, but what I mean of that is, let's take an example, for example, of me personally. Programming is something I really want to get into, that I was, found so interesting, but I was not the type of person that could really strive in it. I tried really hard to learn it and do it, but the way of working, where it was like really focused work, sitting a lot in front of the computer and trying to find the best algorithm, the best solution, I was missing the aspect of working with a team on a daily basis, having meetings, coaching, mentoring, and that meant that from who I was as a person, my inherited characters that I had, was not really matching with the role. So what I mean when I say it is something that can be for everyone, but it doesn't really work, is exactly that. 
you might find that for leadership, there needs to be something that you meet people on a daily basis. You have to interact with them every single day. You need to talk to them, motivate them, and can be very exhausting for some people. So rather than trying to force yourself to do that, because there is expectations put onto you that you should be a leader, it can be much more beneficial to just try and find something else that you're passionate about. But now that I talked about leadership styles, uh, leadership styles, about leadership, and that pretty much everyone can learn it, let's actually look at the next question, which one is the best leadership style? Because why waste time learning a leadership style that is not the best, right? Well, this is where it gets interesting, because I personally never really looked that much on the different leadership styles. I looked at it more from a practical angle of learning the different skills and the different methods that exist and practically applying them to my own work. So let's actually look together now at an exhaustive list of what kind of leadership styles exist. I mean, it can't be that long, right? So I will go a bit quickly in this part because it's quite dry as well. So we have the coaching style and the visionary style. Those two should be quite familiar to a few of you, especially the visionary style is something that's often implemented that focuses on the company's mission where you try to unite your employees towards the mission the company is trying to achieve. Then we got the servant and autocratic ones. A servant is one that you might know from being a scrum master as well. We try to serve the team and accomplish the goals. And we got the autocratic one, where the leader would focus making decisions entirely based on their own judgment, which is not that common in the gaming industry. Then we have the laissez-faire and the democratic one, two more leadership styles. Even more leadership styles, apparently. The uh, pace setter and the transformational. With the transformational one was motivating the team to innovate and create organizational uh, change. So again and again, trying to re-innovate the wheel. And hopefully the final ones, uh, we got the transactional one, was uh, rewarding the team for good performance and punishing them for bad, as well as the bureaucratic one, which is by the book, basically. A phrase you would hear there is, that's how we've always done it. And we all know things don't really go well when you hear that one. It's quite the red flag for sure. So as you can see, I could stand here not only for 45 minutes, but for multiple hours if I would dive into all the different leadership styles, their pros and cons. And even then we would not come to a conclusion which one's the best. Because the truth is, depending on the organization, your team, your project, so many different factors, one will be better than the other. And overall, different leaders will tell you they prefer this one over that one. So there is no real answer. But, of course, this would be a very bad ending for this uh, part of the presentation. So instead, what I propose is a style that combines a lot of the benefits that exist in the other ones. And that one is the charismatic leadership. So from own experience and after some discussions of leaders, uh, both in my current company, previous company, and other companies, we all seem to agree that in the charismatic leadership and the traits that are included there is something that universally seems to work really well in our industry. And this additional advantage is that the traits that you can see there, they really boost anyone's career, no matter if you want to become a leader or not. Because those traits are really beneficial for working in a team, for expressing whatever you're working on, but more to that later. So don't be surprised if during your career then, and you didn't plan to become a lead, all of a sudden your manager will come to you or your current team lead and suggest you to maybe change tracks and go towards a leadership role. So let's have a look at the seven traits of a charismatic leader and how they can actually benefit each of you in your careers. So first one would be humility. Then we got confidence, optimism, self-reflectiveness, communication, enthusiasm, and empathy. But before we enter the final chapter and we talk about all those traits, there's an important disclaimer I need to make. Hard skills are a must. As much as I talked about how those things are really important and will boost your career, if you do not possess the hard skills to actually perform your job, what you're actually being paid for in the end, let's say programming. If you don't know how to program, it doesn't matter how good you are in those seven traits, you will not be able to land a job as a programmer. Same thing as a 3D artist that's supposed to do modeling. If you don't know how to 3D model, you will not be hired for that position. So while hard skills are the magnum opus in the sense of this is what you're being paid for and what they will definitely look at, Let's not disregard what actually uh, comes of the soft skills. Because the soft skills are the big secret sauce. Uh, once we take hard skills out of the equation, or much better formulated, we think about hard skills as being equal amongst the applicants. 
the soft skills come in and they act as a multiplier. You are then in the interview sessions or in when the hiring manager looks at whatever the candidates have and they realize someone has a, a good set of soft skills. They're really talented in those different areas. This is worth so, so much and cannot be underestimated, especially for those of you that will be most in the room that apply for internship roles or junior positions. So yes, let's already enter the final chapter of this presentation, the soft skills, and let's dissect what they make and how they are the secret sauce. But first of all, the why. Like, why, why should you care? Like, why are they such a game changer? And why should you actually care about developing your soft skills? Well, this is what I sometimes felt as being the interviewer for different positions for the companies that I worked at. As I said, hard skills are important, but they are the minimum that you need. It's what you want. It's the ceiling. And anything on top of that is what you're actually more specifically looking for. So you often come in a situation where you have candidates that are really talented, they have a really good set of skills, but they don't really fit the company culture. And what is company culture? Company culture often is a set of different soft skills, what you want to have in your company. And this is where it sometimes can feel like trying to find a unicorn, especially if you're looking then also at more senior roles. You want a senior programmer. Very hard to find, especially the ones that are really talented, because anybody wants a really... Uh, senior programmer that knows how to do all the different aspects in the industry that keeps changing so much. And that's why even then also soft skills are still important. So what is it with soft skills that make them so valuable? Soft skills, like anything you try to learn, take a repeated effort and something that you need to reflect on, then you need to train yourself, then you need the environment as well where people can then tell you, well, you communicated quite well to me. It's quite clear what you're saying. I understand it and it makes them really rare to find on the job market for that specific reason. It's not like, let's say, in the first year here, all of us, I don't know if it's still the case, but we back then learned to use Unity. That is something that can be done quite quickly. You boot up the program, you learn the different buttons. It's something that works quite well. But an opposite to that, if I would tell you now, and that's why at university it's not possible to teach you that, for example, okay, let's see, how can you become a person that's more trusting in others? Well, it's like a completely different aspect. It depends on your background, your life experiences, and that is something that then becomes more your own mission to learn. And there's different methods to do that. There's different videos, tutorials, all kinds of things, but something that takes repeated effort over a long period of time. And the same thing becomes then uh, when I'm hiring. When I, as a QA lead, look at the team, and let's say I hire for a junior position, it's very hard then to uh, think about those soft skills as teachable. If I want to look at, okay, do they know how to use a rich filter dashboard in Jira? They might not, but that's something that, again, I can teach them quite quickly in a day or two, and they will understand it. I can be certain of that. But uh, when it's about, I can already see the way they talked in the interview about their previous company, about their colleagues in a very negative way, that's already quite the red flag, and you think to yourself, okay, is it possible to have them see things in a more optimistic way? Is it possible to have them be enthusiastic for their work? And uh, yes, that is why you should care, basically, to reiterate internships and junior roles. Specifically, their junior skills, uh, junior skills, soft skills are what make the big differentiator. A lack of soft skills will be the deal breaker, but the opposite is true as well. Somebody that might not have exactly what the company is looking for in the hard skill department. You might be a bit more junior in whatever hard skill that you need, but you have, present strong soft skills that is like more often than not an easy hire. And let's actually look at a practical example. So in a real world example, we have person A and person B. If this is the only information we have about them, you would say it's quite easy to see, well, person A, two months of industry experience as an intern, person B, six months industry experience as a junior. So not only does person B have three times the amount of industry experience, but they also did it in a junior role instead of an internship role. So here you would say, okay, let's hire person B. But of course, it's not that simple. If we now add all the other information to it, where well, person A is able to reflect on the answers, to give really nuanced answers. We ask them, for example, what do you think is the difference between severity and uh, priority? They don't just give a textbook answer. They give an answer, but they also give the nuanced feedback of, in their personal opinion, this might be seen that way. Depending on the situation, it could change that way. Person B, however, 
giving a quoted textbook answer is not able to really reflect on it. You give a bit more pressing questions of, well, but what if the situation changes like that? They're not really able to adapt because it's mostly just learned knowledge, not reflected knowledge. And then we go to the next example. The person A is able to communicate openly about their weaknesses and strengths. It's important to be able to do that because if you don't do that and you try to obfuscate any potential weaknesses you have, that is definitely seen as a red flag as well. Because what happens then at work? Nobody's perfect. Everyone needs their colleagues, their knowledge, and everyone needs help at some times. But if you're not able then to ask for that help and you try to obfuscate things, that's when it gets tricky and can be damaging to team morale and also the goal of the company. So, but enough of the why. It's time to look at the what and the list of the soft skills I showed you earlier and what makes them so useful in the career. So this is the list again. And we now go to number one, humility. So nobody is perfect, and the people that think they are, they will sooner or later come to find out they're not. And that is both very true for yourself and for others. It's important to realize that, that you yourself make mistakes, but others as well. Everyone is part of a team in the end. It doesn't matter if you're a senior, junior, mid-level, lead, manager. Everyone's trying to achieve something together, and that's why it's very important to have humility. And even more so, I know that this university, your lecturers keep telling you that uh, the industry is quite small. Don't make enemies. And I can tell you this is very, very true from my own experience because there were several instances where someone applied to the company and then the hiring manager will always uh, ask colleagues that worked, uh, studied at either at the same university or worked at the same company as the person applying, what do you know about them? What can you tell me? And uh, when there was an individual that just behaved like, let's put it frankly, an asshole during the studies, they thought they were so much better than everyone else, they made everyone's life difficult. That is not a person you want to hire, because those toxic traits, again, they are also soft skills in a way. That means it's someone that inherently displayed really bad traits, and that is very hard to change. So it doesn't matter if you then have a stellar portfolio, that toxic behavior is a red flag that will not land you a job. Enthusiasm. The good thing about enthusiasm is it's contagious. What that means is, I don't know about you, but for me, I can listen to anybody that talks really enthusiastically. It doesn't matter what it is. Shoelace collection, game development, or why they're mistaken that coriander tastes good. I don't know either, but apparently some people believe that. So charismatic people to strive to exhibit that. They talk passionately, they live passionately in their jobs. They go to work with enthusiasm that's really contagious. And that is something that is exceptionally uh, well perceived at the workplace. Um, especially in our industry where the hierarchy is quite flat, oftentimes a manager has a task that needs to be tackled, but they're not really sure who of the team members would be the best because there's so many different skills we have in the team. So often it's posed into the room, okay, we have this problem. Uh, it would be good if someone has the time or opportunity to pick this up. And this is always very favorable for those individuals that enthusiastically pick those tasks up. And it doesn't matter if you're perfect at it. Those, that enthusiasm and trying to solve the issue, even if you just do the first pre-study of like finding possible solutions, and then you hand that back, it's already progress that will make it easier for whoever is most likely to possess that skill to then fulfill that task, to pick it up and do it. So enthusiasm can never be an underestimated and it's pretty much always seen extremely favorable when it also comes to uh, um, changing into a different position because you already proved that you are someone that wants to tackle problems. Then the next one, optimism. I don't need to tell you that life doesn't go linear and a lot of plans we have and things we want to try and achieve, well, there's a lot of things that just come in the way of stopping us or leading us a different path. A very uh, simple example is you plan something for the weekend with your friends of yours, outdoors. Well, the weather can change. All of a sudden, it might not be possible to go outdoors anymore. Someone has something happening in their private life, they can't show up anymore. There's so many different factors that could prevent something that you planned to happen. And that's not only true at work, but also in your, uh, not only true in your private life, but also in work life. So what instead is really good to do to have this optimistic outlook. Confidence is something where it comes from within. You believe there's any task that comes your way, you're able to tackle it. With optimism, it's quite similar, but there the belief is something bad happens, there's an opportunity that lies within it. And that's very true in a lot of times. For example, what happened in my work life is there was a bug that was not discovered. It made it into the live production phase. It made it onto the 
uh, public build, and it was a bit of an issue. We had to do a hot fix, it cost us time, money, and so on. So if you're not optimistic about it or even pessimistic, you can see like huge issue. Team fucked up, I should have seen this. This is catastrophic, big issue. But the truth in it is, it was something that happened because of the process that we used. The process made it so it was not possible to find this issue. So it was not a problem of someone themselves fucking up. It was an issue of the process not working in a way to discover that. And not only was it the case for that one studio, but all the other studios in the company. So what we then did is we sat together, we looked at how we can make this not happen again, how we can change the process in a way to discover issues like that going forward. And the good thing is we implemented this not only for our studio, but all the other studios as well. And then in the future, we found more and more issues of the same type before they went into production. So this is the way of seeing something that might be really troublesome in the moment, but how we can turn it. It's not about lying to yourself. Ah, it's not that bad, it's fine. No, it's something that bad that happened, but how can we turn it into something good? And last but not least, uh, optimism and negativity are also quite contagious. So, uh, which is why during a hiring process, when someone talks negatively about their coworkers, about the previous company, it's a huge red flag and they will get filtered out. Well, then we have confidence, or how I like to call it, authentic confidence. Because there's the mantra that many of you might know about fake it till you make it. There is something that can be quite applicable and help a lot. I mean, we all have imposter syndrome once in a while, and that is where fake it till you make it can help you. But something that's much more important is true confidence, and it plays into what I mentioned before. Humility. Accepting that everyone does mistakes, you yourself included. And you're not good at everything, and you will never be. I myself know there's some hard skills I just don't feel like they, they work for me well. No matter how much time I'll put into it, there will always be people better at it than me. But that is not an issue, because you will be working in a team where some people are better at skill A, you're better at skill B, you work together, and that is what makes it work. We're in a very diverse industry with very different backgrounds, cultures, and so on, and there's a true strength behind it. Nobody needs to be perfect, and we can all strive to just be better. And then we have communication, especially those of you in the project management manner will have heard a lot about open communication, nonviolent communication, and all the different styles. Individuals that make use of those are able to talk, speak clearly, openly, and encourage the team to also speak up about potential issues. Because when you have this culture where the team is not afraid to speak up, where the team is not afraid to point at things they perceive as issues, then you can also prevent a lot of problems from happening because everyone can see it from a different perspective. You don't need to be someone that later in the industry then works as a game designer to still see, test the game that you're working on and say, you know what, I think this doesn't really work towards the goal we're having. This does not give me the feeling of exploration. It feels very restrictive. And that is why it's really important to also value everyone's opinions and the communication to be very open so those channels can actually flow. And now we will go into something that was called the framing effect. Because communication goes further than just the teamwork and how you talk to others. Uh, no matter how much we try, there will always be cognitive bias. That is just the matter of the world and how it works. And especially now when I take you through this example of a raffle ticket. Let's say I have a lottery ticket. But I frame it in a way of telling you you have a 10% chance to win $100 and a 90% chance to lose the $5. Well, the only thing you will focus on is like 90% chance to lose $5. That's insane. Like, I'm not going to take that bet. But then if I rephrase with the same logic behind it, nothing changed here. No probability changed. None of uh, the money that you actually placed down or you can win. But instead I focus on buying a $5 raffle ticket gives you a 10% chance of winning $100 and a 90% chance of winning nothing. It's the same thing, but now it's much more focused on 10% chance to win $100. Well, that's pretty good. One in 10 person. And in a similar manner, you will also frame your results at work every time you present it. And what will happen then is either you lift yourself when you work up, or in, when you uh, then communicate what you did, it could be that you come across as arrogant. So this is a scenario that is very real. I talked to many of my friends. They felt the same thing when they started in the industry. You sit in front of your laptop. Your manager encourages you to talk about what kind of issue you solved, what kind of project you worked on. And you're like, oh, God, like, how do I phrase this now? Like, 
They don't know exactly what I did, so do I phrase it very long, but nobody's gonna read it? Do I phrase it very shortly? Does it come across as arrogant? So the skill of communication cannot be underestimated. Because what that also does is the way that when you frame what you have done will be perceived very differently. If you frame it in a way where it seems like you're putting yourself down or your work, you might be perceived as not very confident. So someone that doesn't strive to climb in the ladder. But if you are confident in framing how you did your work, if you're able to put the finger on what makes it actually beneficial for others, the project that you worked on, new gyra filters, whatever it might be, then all of a sudden, just through a very short sentence that others read, they realize what you're actually contributing, and they might actually check out that project that you did and be really impressed with what you're doing. Self-reflectiveness. It's one of my absolute favorite soft skills, both in myself and in others, because we often don't realize what our actions actually have an effect on other people, unless we sometimes take the time to self-reflect on both our actions on how we formulate things, as well as the knowledge that is given to us. Uh, I showed you before the scenario of someone that applied for a job. And when you're not able to reflect on why this method might be the best, if you actually maybe don't even believe it, but you just quote it because you know, oh, this is, this is like the knowledge that people think is the best. You will not really understand it. You will not be able to talk about it enthusiastically. It's just something that you kind of learned. It's kind of there. And also on top of that, Self-reflectiveness is a good skill to have for critical thinking, for looking at different problems or the same problem and finding different solutions, different angles, something someone else might not have tried yet. And that is why it's extremely beneficial in our industry because what we have is game design is neither science nor art. There's something in between. There's clear rules, there's things we know that work, but overall it's more of an art form. So to be able to reflectively look at it and find the nuances in the problem is where then game design becomes much more interesting. And last but not least, we have empathy. Empathy plays an important role in creating games. Once you're able to put yourself in the shoes of others, let's say your target audience, for example, you will be able to design games that are much more suited towards them. You will be able to push through to success much more easily. But it's not just about success. Because empathy can help you resolve conflicts, both in your team, even in your private life, you will be able to understand that someone might be upset, not about necessarily something you did, but something that affected them in their life today. So once you have unlocked the ability to be more emp empathetic, you'll be surprised how much trusting your team will become towards you and how much more trusting you can become towards your team. Because you try to look again at what is happening from a different angle. And with that, we have already reached the end of my talk. And now, thanks for listening, and I'm open to any questions. Mm -hmm. So the question is basically how in a letter of motivation you would phrase your soft skills or how would you tell them that you're good at the soft skills. Uh, there, there's a principle that really works quite well. You don't really talk about, oh, I'm good at teamwork, I'm a team player, I'm very motivated, because frankly, everyone will write that. And it's also not really uh, looked at very positively because there's no example. The good way to phrase those things in a letter of motivation is to give clear examples to basically then talk about uh, how you solved the problem of the team together, how you successfully changed from, let's uh, take an example of my QA background from QA, you apply for a QA position and then you talk about how you had 20 bucks and you discovered them in a manner of two playtest sessions, you were able to prioritize them and fix them with the team. That shows critical thinking, problem solving, the ability to communicate with your team and prioritize. So in an example that you give, you basically show the soft skills. And there's actually an app as well that was developed here at Uppsala University um, by Elias and the team where you can actually then uh, discover what kind of soft skills you already have and how to communicate them quite well. So that is an app that you might want to check out. It's called Skill Mill. And with that, then you can see how you can phrase 
better on the soft skills. Mm -hmm. So your question is basically how to talk honestly about your strengths and weaknesses, especially if there's not many strengths, but quite big weaknesses. Mm. Well, first of all, I highly doubt that you don't have strengths. Everyone does. So the first thing you should do then is reflect on, maybe talk to the team members that you worked on with on projects. What do you perceive as my strengths? Because they will definitely have some things to tell you, uh, not only for hard skills, but also soft skills. When it comes to the weaknesses, uh, what I'm not proposing necessarily is that you go into an interview and you open up and you're like, oh, I'm never on time, <laughs> I, um, I barely get out of bed, I only do it for the money, like I really hate working actually. That's not what it's about. Uh, what it's about in the end is that, first of all, the question is not asked a lot anymore nowadays, at least in the game industry from my experience, like what is your biggest weakness? But there is uh, some great strength again in being honest about your weaknesses. So, for example, one of my weaknesses that uh, I used to uh, say in job interviews is that I used to take uh, on too many tasks where there was like projects where people were like, oh, can someone do this? And I would take on too many, which would then be problematic for me to actually finish a task. And uh, I would not want to let go of the task because I wanted to finish it. And all of a sudden, I have way too many tasks that I need to focus on. That is a weakness because in the end, that means that I wasn't able to prioritize my tasks properly. But I then proposed and told them, which actually did happen as well, how I slowly changed that around. Where I'm conscious about it, I reflect on it, and I take more time now to just take on a task and make sure I finish before I take an, up a new one. So again, it's about reflecting what you can do to work on your weaknesses and start working on that already. Does that somehow answer your question? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Nick, um, you started your talk talking a little bit about how you transitioned into a leader role. Mm -hmm. um, and that you, before then, you had a lot more hands-on uh, connection with the, with the games uh, in Q&A. So I had this kind of prior image of a leader being much more into the people management of things and having less into the 
influence over the actual game or artifact that is being created. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering a little bit about uh, if you could speak to that, seeing how you know we're we're all here because we love games. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are other you know universities that focus primarily on leadership and creating people who are good with other people. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? So your question is basically about how it actually looks like when you're in the lead position, how close you are to the game. Yes, the, the kind of influence. That mm -hmm. I mean, that really depends on the company. Um, some companies, it's interesting, they just have a QA lead at the very top and there's like basically a manager. But some companies have a QA manager that does basically only in management. So they have one-on-ones with the team, they have salary discussions and so on, but they're completely away from the game. Yeah. Um, then you have a company like at Paradox where there's the QA lead who is then the lead of an entire game project. So my role, for example, is I create uh, the structure for the team, I delegate a lot of tasks, I make sure that the way we work for the game is customized for that game that we're working on, that works with the studio and team we have. Mm -hmm. So what I still do is I actively uh, join meetings where we discuss what we work on the sprint, I still check out what's actually happening with the game, I play it myself, so I'm still very embedded in the game. Once you go even higher than towards the pure management position, that's when you're very detached. But luckily in most studios, there's still like this in-between where you're managing a team, but you're also working in a cross-functional team with the team. So that's then the part also where it becomes interesting where you can see, is that something for me? Because you still work on the game, but you also explore all the team leadership and team management aspects already. Yeah. And then you can decide, is it something that you actually want to fully lean into and become a manager? Or do you rather want to go back more towards the game or stay in the position that you're at? So it's not as binary, black and white, where it's like, oh shit, now I'm completely out of the game and I'm just doing tasks like a uh, bureaucrat in a way. Yeah. But it's a much more fluid way of how it works. Yeah, that, that sounds like a holy grail. That sounds really, really <laughs> fun. Perfect. Hey. hey. Uh, how did uh, being a Scrum Master inform your leadership style uh, now being the QA lead? Uh, so the question was uh, how being a Scrum Master influenced my leadership style as a QA lead. And uh, I would say Scrum Master, it's about serving the team. It's uh, about uh, resolving issues and making sure there's no impediments. And I think that definitely influenced uh, the way that I led teams because it was much more about empowering the team and making sure that they have the tools necessary to perform the tasks and not about being a bureaucrat or someone autocratic that would sit on top of them and tell them what to do. Uh, a lot of times there was still the need of an important task coming in and then I delegate clearly to the team, okay, I know this person has time, this person might be the best suited for the task, so I do delegate, but other times there might be a, not a harsh deadline upcoming. And then it's just openly asking to the team, okay, who of you would feel free to take up this task, who has time? So in the best case scenario, you have a very open environment where you take care of the impediments, you let the team pull their own tasks, very much in an agile way, but sometimes, of course, there's still the need to be a bit more direct in how you approach things. Mm -hmm. So the question was basically, if uh, you didn't network a lot and uh, when you apply for junior position, there's not the ability of having like a foot in the door through a connection, like how you stand out. Um, that is, of course, a bit more difficult um, because in the end, it's not that black and white either, though, like a connection doesn't necessarily get you an interview even. There were a lot of times where I knew someone in the company, but I didn't even land the, the first interview. Uh, what actually happens is, there it becomes more about like catering your CV to the actual position. Now, a lot of people I've seen, they uh, use the exact same CV for all kinds of roles they apply to, and then as a hiring manager, you look at the CV and you immediately see there's just one they spam to every kind of position available. What becomes much more important is to look at the uh, role description and see the key points that they try to see and want to have. And then in the letter of motivation or in your CV itself, you can clearly like put those key points in. And then you customize your CV basically for every single job and role position. You're not lying, but you're just changing the way you phrase things towards what their language they are using. 
because if a, um, let's say, great team player can be also phrased very differently of has worked in a team of uh, size five to six people, is able to work in large scale teams. And then you can reflect on, do you have that experience? More often than not, you do have either exact experience or something close to it. And then it becomes about putting that in a nice format on a CV and that's your foot in the door basically. Oh, yes. Yeah, maybe some pointers on to what, what to look for, what, what are like some little tricks that you in a hiring procedure look for uh, in a CV or in a personal letter, how can you get a good first impression there? Mm -hmm. So the harsh truth is that uh, you get a lot of applicants. So you don't have time to look at 10 minutes at every single CV because then you would just sit there looking at the CV for weeks for one single position. Doesn't mean we don't look at them, doesn't mean we discard them for any kind of small mistake, but what it comes more about is that you have a CV, best case scenario, one page. You don't need two pages unless you're like an industry veteran of 20 years plus experience, and even then, most likely it would be enough to just have your most recent uh, work experiences and accomplishments. So I would say really important is that you're short and concise of your bullet points. Again, as previously mentioned for another question, that you're very clear of examples given. It's not about, ah, I'm this, I'm that. No, it's I did this and that shows that. And the showing part is then just contextual taken out of how you defined and formulated things. So it's about being short, concise, having a clear structure that's readable. You could even like bold some sections that stand out clearly. So when you as a hiring manager then fly over the CV or someone that's involved in hiring, you can immediately see the bullet points and realize, oh, that's exactly what we we're looking for. Instead of having big, uh, paragraphs of text that become very convoluted and hard to read, which we still will do in the end, but it becomes much harder and changes your perspective a bit. So definitely try to have a concise CV, one page, focus on the soft skills that you have that might be valid for the job and position, and make sure that it's tailored also at the top, you can always then have the job that you're applying for as the title, junior programmer, junior script or whatever it is. So it doesn't look like what you're looking for is something completely different than the position. do have to do a lot and have to put a lot of effort into basically applying and getting interviews, trying to land a job, and it does not always end well. So you might uh, do two months of basically a side job to your current job, trying to get a new one, a better one, a different one that suits your ambitions more. Mm -hmm. um, a minor question for me is, where would you put, suggest to put one's focus uh, is the tailored CV tailored to the specific job the whole grail, or is portfolio as important as that? And another question to that is, when you are hiring, do you actually reach out to, what percentage of people do you reach out to? Because it does seem like you need to pass the threshold of, okay, this CV is good, and all the materials you send me is good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically your first question was where to basically spend the focus on tailored CV or portfolio. Um, to that, uh, the, and like in many things in life, the answer depends. From my perspective, when it comes to QA, it's really hard to have a portfolio. You do not really have a game where you can say, look, it's bug free, I made it bug free. <laughs> uh, opposed to being a programmer, it's very important to have a good portfolio. Their portfolio comes first, for example, over the CV in the end, because if you have a very impressive portfolio, you can show that you program something quite complex in a short time frame. That becomes like the keystone then to getting hired, opposed to just having a nice CV. The part about having a CV that is like clear to read and stands out in a way, is that it informs the hiring manager then about those skills. And it makes it easier to understand what the person is doing. It can also already show soft skills. Are you able to reflect on your strengths and weaknesses? That's what I talked about before. So in the end, a portfolio is extremely important, more important than the CV, but the CV helps you to get the foot into the door. 
because that is something that happened to me a lot as well. A lot of times I didn't even get a reply or the first interview, but once I got into the interview, then it was quite easy to get to the last path. Because this is why I say again, the CV becomes really important to get your foot into the door, and the portfolio is the basis around the hard skills that they are looking for. So I would say definitely if you're someone that needs a portfolio, artist, programmer, game designer, focus on the portfolio, but make sure that the CV at least has like the necessary uh, formatting that makes it easy to read. Doesn't need to be fluffy, doesn't need to be pretty to look at in terms of like some highlight colors and whatnot. It's more about easy to read content. And we are so happy that you could join us here today. Yes, thank you everyone. And <laughs>